Um, so as you know, treatment of infectious disease is one of the medical disciplines that's becoming progressively less effective. And this is mainly due to drug resistance. Uh, especially in antibiotics, which combined with the lack of understanding the full details of the drug action. Therefore, it's uh, important uh, and realistic uh, to look to the off-targets of the drug. And this area is a fertile land for different disciplines like metabolomics, for example, to explore and discover. Uh, so I'll start my presentation with a brief introduction about metabolomics and antibiotics in general. Then it will be followed by a few previous projects uh, that show the applications of metabolomics in the area of infectious disease. <coughs> Starting with a uh, brief introduction about metabolomics, the earliest study of small molecules related to health and human were performed uh, around uh, uh, 2000 BC when ants were used by uh, a t traditional Chinese doctor to estimate glucose level in urine. Since then there has been a continuous development and techniques for detect uh, and measure small molecules and across the whole spectrum of such development uh, one <coughs> of the most recent breakthrough is the emergence of metabolomics. It's a complex science that covers several different disciplines, analytical organic chemistry, bioinformatics and chemometrics, and uh, bioscience. Um, it's derived from metabolism, which originates from a Greek word metabol, which means changes. Now, uh, there are few, many definitions for metabolomics, and maybe when you go to the re in the review paper, you'll find metabolomics, metabolomics, and these things. But let's stick to metabolomics. Uh, it's divide, uh, and it's defined as a non-biased, comprehensive identification and quantification of the entire metabolome under a given set of condition uh, with a high selectivity and sensitivity in analytical techniques. Uh, unfortunately, there is no one particular or a combination of techniques that can detect all or determine all metabolites uh, in mammalian, plant, or microbial metabolome. There are, therefore, there are several techniques that used instead of trying to uh, detect the whole metabolome, like metabolic profiling, uh, which is uh, 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 detect uh, a wide range of metabolites that either correlate to a specific metabolic, metabolic pathway or metabolites that share similar chemistry in terms, for example, of polarity. Uh, or target analysis, which mainly concentrate in a single or highly, highly correlated metabolites, and it's require uh, additional sample preparation. Metabolic fingerprinting and footprinting, which require actually minimal sample preparation, and it's mainly used for classification and discrimination. Uh, the fields of applications of uh, metabolomics are widespread and include plant science, medical science, pharmaceutical research, and many other applications. Uh, this mainly because metabolomics offers some distinct advantages, making this area um, a complementary uh, to other uh, omics, uh, like it's uh, the downstream product of the genome, so it's not far or close to the function or phenotype of the cell. Uh, another benefit is that it's uh, a high throughput with a relative low cost per analysis. Uh, additionally, the application of metabolic control analysis uh, demonstrates that changes in the concentration of metabolites can be observed even if alteration in the concentration of uh, transcript or protein, for example, is uh, small or not detectable. So this makes metabolomics uh, uh, an area or a field that can be uh, that has a high discriminati discriminatory. It's a high discriminatory field that can use to uh, detect changes in biology. Uh, these advantages and many other advantages reflected on the number of publications which grow uh, on the last few years. Now, uh, moving to antibiotics, uh, quickly, it's substances produced by microorganisms antagonistic to the growth or life <coughs> of higher, uh, uh, growth or life of other uh, microorganisms. This is the basic definitions because before we find uh, or before they discover uh, um, uh, antibiotics or when they use 
the term, when they didn't use the term antibiotics for synthetic products. And uh, the main problem for this drug uh, uh, class, as we mentioned before, it's the drug resistance. Uh, and this can be seen from that when we discover, an, or antibiotic discovered, there are resistance that follow it uh, directly. Uh, there are several modes of action for antibiotics, as well as uh, different mechanisms of resistance. Uh, in my research, we concentrated on the second mechanism of action, inhibitors of nucleic acid synthesis, by its different levels of inhibitions, either directly like cyprofloxacin or indirectly like trimethoprim. Now, trimethoprim, for example, it's a basic drug with BKA 7.4. It inhibits dihydrophilate reductase enzyme with high selectivity. The main mechanism of resistance for this drug is uh, what they call it metabolic bypass by producing an additional enzyme that is uh, less sensitive to the drug. Uh, trimethoprim mainly used for urinary tract infection, which is one of the most common uh, infections in humans, and mainly in females. Uh, most of the drug excreted unchanged in urine that has a pH roughly for a healthy person, 4.6 to 7.5. Due to this, and because of the drug mainly excreted in, or, or, or fight the bacteria in urine, we were thinking, does antibiotic, uh, does antibiotic organization status affect the microbial metabolome? So we build an investigation, uh, and we try to investigate this and answer this question using a <coughs> metabolomic-based approach. So um, we inoculate E. coli K12 at two different pH levels, five and seven, trying to mimic the human urine, and challenge it with three concentrations below and including the minimum inhibitory concentration of uh, trimethoprim, uh, which was determined in a bioscreen, by bioscreen in a, in a preliminary experiment. Then we used LCMS to estimate intracellular trimethoprim levels at pH five and seven, Finally, we used FTIR and GCMS analysis of incubated samples to produce a global snapshot and bacterial phenotypic and target metabolic profile of each condition. Uh, I'll just, I would like to let you know that uh, samples uh, generated or produced for, for bioscreen, FTIR, and MS experiments are produced from the same stock, which should be here, but. It's, it's, it's here, but it's not there. <laughs> okay. So uh, it, it's the same stack to minimize any and exclude any variations that might occur between different stacks. Now, starting with bioscreen experiment, as you can see here that uh, drugs at, uh, drug uh, molecules at pH 7 shows a stronger effect than at pH 5. Uh, it's important to remember that trimethoprim is a basic drug, as I mentioned before, but it still shows an effect at pH 5, uh, which means that it can pass through the soil wall and cause an effect. Uh, we proved this by a, a small LCMS experiment, and we found that trimethoprim accumulated inside the cell at pH 5. Then samples were analyzed by FTIR, and uh, uh, the, uh, and uh, the data were obtained from a dried cell biomass. Uh, subsequently, a BCDFA was applied to the data. And uh, we found here that blue highlighted symbols, which is, uh, represent samples incubated at pH 7, uh, form two different clusters, far from control and the lowest dose, while at pH 5, only, which represented by, uh, or highlighted by red, only samples uh, challenged with the highest dose separated from the rest of samples. So therefore, we uh, further analyze samples using uh, GCMS, trying to investigate this variation, I, I mean between FTIR samples, which might reflect a phenotypic effect, and also to produce a metabolic profile of each condition uh, which might help us to have a further understanding of the drug action on E. coli when it's incubated in conditions that have a pH level similar to urine. So uh, sa samples for GCMS were subjected to a multivariate uh, data analysis after data pre-processing. And here is the BCDFA, and uh, samples were distributed similar to uh, FTIR uh, results. 
Then these are the metabolites that have been detected by GCMS. They were highlighted in a Kig metabolic pathway of E. coli K12. As you can see here, it's complex, and I think it's difficult to correlate these metabolites together. So we decided to simplify the pathway, depending on Kig and many other uh, sources or references, like EcoCyc, and we decided to to make uh, dihydrophilate reductase the main target of the drug as a starting point of the pathway. <coughs> now, due to the permeability of drug molecules at BH7, so uh, we expected to see that metabolites linked with this enzyme at BH7 will show a stronger response than metabolites extracted at BH5. Now, uh, when trimethoprim acts as a blocker or it's inhibit dihydrophilate reductase enzyme, this will deprive the cell from tetrahydrophilate and will cause an accumulation of dihydrophilate. Now, it's proved from previous studies that dihydrophilate acts as a uh, competitive inhibitor of polypolyglutamate synthase. So this will cause an accumulation of glutamate. So we expected to see this in our results uh, when the drug is highly active, i.e. at page 7, and, and that's what you found, and you find glutamate is high, uh, show an upregulation when the drug is uh, highly active. Now, uh, a glutamate involved in the biosynthesis of ornithine and proline, both amino acids gave the same response of glutamate and they were upregulated when the drug is highly active. Now, reduction of tetrahydrofolate caused a reduction in 5-methyl tetrahydrofolate, 5-10-methylene tetrahydrofolate and 10-formyl tetrahydrofolate because actually it's a key metabolite that involves in the biosynthesis or synthesis of these metabolites. So, starting with 5-10-methylene tetrahydrofolate, reduction in this metabolite that catalyzed by thiamidylate synthase to uh, methylate deoxyuridine monophosphate uh, and producing deoxythymidine monophosphate uh, show a reduction in uracil and, deoxy uh, and deoxythymidine monophosphate or thymine. Unfortunately, this enzyme, it's only a one direction enzyme in, in E. coli, not like many other organisms. So therefore, it can't explain the reduction in uracil, but we know that nucleobases are correlated to each other. So it might be interesting to see what's the relation between this, but actually for E. coli, unfortunately, we didn't find an explanation. Now, um, in 2010, Kwan et al. mentioned that when you challenge E. coli K12 for two hours with trimethoprim, carcimate downstream product, phenylalanine, tyrosine, and tryptophan will give the same response. But in our situation, where samples were collected after 18 hours, and we put the drug from, from the beginning, we found that tryptophan have another response from other downstream product, and it was highly upregulated when the drug is highly active. Now, um, homocysteine methylated to produce methionine. Uh, methionine was now regulated when the drug is highly active at BH7, highest dose. Uh, it's known that methionine acts as a regulator of the first enzyme in its de novo biosynthesis, homocysteine or succinyl transferase. So we expect that methionine was consumed for a feedback inhibition to block this enzyme. Now this enzyme converts homocysteine to osexinyl homocysteine. So let's say, if we say that methionine blocked this enzyme, this will cause an accumulation of homocysteine. Homocysteine is known that it acts as a, a competitive inhibitor of glutamate dehydrogenase. So from this hypothesis, we think that if methionine is now regulated, this will cause an upregulation of glutamate. And this match with our results. It's maybe need further investigation and the fluxomic study, but this is what we found that when methionine down regulated, uh, uh, glutamate was upper regulated. Uh, now, glutamate and proline both act in osmoprotectant. So, when the bacteria under the stress of the drug, it will pr produce and generate more osmoprotectant. Same for triolose, which is here, and uh, that consists of two glucose units. 
now there is a regulate uh, there is an os osmolecular regulated enzyme called trialose uh, phosphate synthase that consume glucose to produce trialose. So when the bacteria under the stress try to produce more osmoprotectin. So we expected to see high levels of trialose, and that's actually what we found. And according to the previous hypothesis, we found that the glucose levels were downregulated when the drug is highly active. Generally speaking, when the bacteria are under any stress, it will increase mainly, or most of the time, the catabolism reaction. So this will consume more sugars. Now, consuming sugars will cause an accumulation of pyruvate, one of them, the product of gly glycolysis. And this will reflect it on alanine, which is uh, known that it's uh, act as a regulator of sugar metabolisms in uh, uh, higher organisms. And on the detected uh, uh, metabolites from the TCA cyclic, malate and citrate. Uh, and that's what you find exactly, and the rest of bioavate may be backed up in the form of lactic acid. So at this stage, we have to do a small investigation, uh, try to understand uh, the changes and metabolites that we detected and their levels at two pH levels. Back to the question that we asked before, does antibiotic ionization status affect the microbial metabolome? We can say that at pH 7, which most people do their experiment, dihydrophilate reductase enzyme does show a strong response, similar for TCA members, lactic acid, alanine, and many other uh, <coughs> metabolites that might correlate with osmoprotectant. We saw a, a, a down regulation for nucleotide sugars and methionine. But what people missed is, and you, we can find few, three or four publications, uh, that they made it on pH 7. But on the other hand, what people missed is at pH 5, which we have considered uh, now as an important part of our experiment because of the acidic environment of uh, trimethoprim, uh, acidic environment of urine, where it's the, but the battlefield of trimethoprim. We found that guanine is upper regulated, and there are many other amino acids follow this response, which need a further investigation and analysis. Now, uh, move to another line of research. Uh, there is a need for a high throughput, uh, comprehensive, reproducible, and precise ele evaluation method uh, to assess and discriminate between the cause of infections. So, and I, I mentioned before that metabolomics has a high level of discrimination. Therefore, we applied this uh, tool, let's say, or this, uh, this, this field to discriminate between neuropathogenic E. coli isolates from different sequence type and even from the same sequence type. So, and the fair, in this study, uh, we developed a high throughput method that uh, mainly use a simple sample preparation and can run up to 200 samples under exactly the same condition and uh, at the same time to discriminate between 10 pathogenic E. coli isolates, five of which belong to the a popular clone, ST131. And we modified the sample preparation here in two main stages. First, we used bioscreen plates for microculturing rather than traditional flasks. Second, we found that excluding the washing step that they used in sample uh, preparation uh, would give us a, a rich information that can help on discrimination. And we found that, as we can see here, that ST131 clustered close to each other comparing with non-ST131. There is a certain degree of sub classification for sensitive isolates, which represented by red, from resistance isolates. And these are sensitive to quinolone. But we didn't mention this because it needs further investigations. Uh, so we stopped and published until this part. And in Manchester, they complete work in this area. Uh, then the previous approach, 
was applied in another study that uh, aimed to have a reproducible workflow for lipidome analysis uh, using LCMS. And we observed that there is a similar discrimination uh, between FTIR spectroscopy and the negative mode of LCMS in terms of distinguishing samples. But this needs uh, a further investigation with a large number of samples. And that's what we actually made on the next experiment. So here it's more comprehensive. We used uh, our uh, four metabolomics platform, FTIR, GCMS, LCMS in both neg negative and positive mode, were investigated using 11 neuropathogenic E. coli isolates. And this time, these isolates are from the same sequence type. So we try to move more advanced and see to which level we can discriminate. Uh, these 11 isolates uh, uh, were comprehensive, uh, characterized in previous papers using uh, uh, traditional microbiological techniques like variance factor tests and metabolic tests. So this gave us an opportunity to compare these, the results from the ordinary techniques with results from the uh, analytical techniques that we use in metabolomics. Cluster analysis was applied on uh, the results, trying to see if there is any similarity between the platforms or the analytical techniques. Similar, we try to see if there is any correlation between uh, analytical techniques and the ordinary uh, techniques. So we used cluster analysis and we generated six scores plots. Then we used progress tree transformation trying to match these PCs together and see if there is any correlation in terms of spatial arrange arrangement. We found that aligned with our previous <coughs> finding that negative mode of LCMS and FTIR they are match together or they have a, a co they have, let's say, a com comparable uh, uh, ability to, to discriminate between isolates. We find that also the, these are, they are matched with variance factor tests. On the other hand, GCMS, we're matching with uh, more with metabolic tests, but not uh, variance factor tests. And this is a summary of this work, which is discrimination. So. FTIR with pi screen to discriminate ST131 and non ST131. And then we added LCMS negative mood. Then we go further, advance, and use the same sequence type. And we found that GCMS match with the metabolic tests and uh, FTIR and the negative mood match with the variance factor test. At the end, I would like to thank my previous colleagues, my supervisor, Roy Goodacre, and all my uh, colleagues at the Laboratory of Bionautical <coughs> Spectroscopy. Uh, and as I understood from yesterday that not too many of you visit Saudi Arabia. And as I studied the United Kingdom, I knew that most <laughs> people think it's a desert and oil. So I brought different pictures for the country from different regions. This is Riyadh. This is the e east of Saudi Arabia, Riyadh, west of Saudi Arabia, Riyadh, north of Saudi Arabia. And we have our own style on and uh, west of Saudi Arabia, south of Saudi Arabia, center, east, and Riyadh. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs>